about 10 years ago, I worked graveyard as a deputy for a fairly small county, geographically in the south. I'd usually be on the 7p to 7am shift, but occasionally work the 3pm to 3am on a split when we were shorthanded. The area we covered included the outskirts of a college town approximately 125,000 people. By the time this particular incident occurred, I was an overnight supervisor and seen my fair share of strange things. I believe in the paranormal based on what I've seen, but I do my best to disprove everything and not to get ahead of myself. However, this particular case has been filed away in my mind as one of the strangest and potentially unexplained paranormal encounters I have had during my time at the department. Due to the fact that the college town's police department ran short staff most weeknights, our department ran at least two officers on the outskirts of the college area to help out where we could. On any given night, we'd have the unruly 21-year-old drunk at the bar, a couple of DUI stops, and the occasional drug overdose, pretty common stuff for a college town. This particular event happened on Sunday night around 4am in late August. One of my newer officers was patrolling the college area and radioed that he had seen a 90s Oldsmobile four-door parked in a college bar parking lot with the lights and engine running. This is a fairly low violent crime area, but had its share of drug possession and distribution stops by the local PD and our department over the years. This was fairly odd, as all of the staff from the bar had left for the evening and typically, we didn't encounter cleaning staff in that area until 5 or 6 a.m. From the young officer's observation driving through the lot, there was no one in the vehicle. He made a courtesy stop, verified that no one was in the vehicle, checked the doors, found them locked, and relayed this information to me in dispatch. I advised to keep patrolling the area, and I would head his way to check the area for any potential vandalism. He proceeded to leave the lot, drive two blocks, and go down an alley that ran behind the bar. After five or six minutes after radio traffic, Dispatch sends out a suspicious vehicle call in the area matching the description of the Oldsmobile in question. Apparently, some college kids were out jogging early, passed the car, saw a body slumped over the steering wheel and called 911. At this point, the local PD got wind of the call and four units headed to the parking lot. I was particularly irritated as I believed that the young officer that initially stopped out with the car got spooked by the body and conveniently omitted the fact to keep from making contact with the person, living or dead, inside without backup. I was the first unit to roll up on the car. The description by the college kids didn't match what I saw. When I arrived, the driver's side door was open and a woman in her early 60s had one leg out of the vehicle and was slumped over with her head leaning toward the passenger side seat. I quickly radioed that he had a 1054, possibly deceased subject, needed EMS and a coroner to respond to the scene. From my initial observations, it appeared the woman had been deceased for at least four to five hours due to rigor mortis setting in. It also appeared that liver mortis had begun, and I did not have the training to determine the exact time frame. This observation was confirmed by the other responding officers, including the young deputy who initially stopped out with the car. Once again, I kept my irritation with the young deputy under wraps until the body was removed and we cleared the call. I had an impromptu come to Jesus with the young deputy and chastised him about being less than forthcoming about his initial investigation. However, the young deputy was adamant about what he had seen. Finally, I pulled the video from his in-car camera to put the issue to rest. What I saw still haunts me to this day. The video clearly shows the deputy pulling up to the Oldsmobile with his camera showing the driver and driver's side rear door. Based on the way he shined his spotlight on the vehicle, one could easily see if there was a body in the vehicle slumped over the steering wheel as the college kids had described. I watched the video at least 20 times. The deputy shined his flashlight on both sides of the car with no body to be found. There was absolutely nothing in that car save for the light and engine running. I apologized to the young deputy and ended up buying his lunch for the next couple of weeks because I felt so bad about chewing him out. The next night, I followed up the sergeant at the local PD who responded to the call with us. His guys questioned the college kids multiple times about potentially tampering with the scene of the crime due to the disparity between their story and the way we found the body. 
The sergeant was hot about filing tampering charges on the kids because he was certain that they moved the body and were somehow responsible. I had a copy of the young deputy's in-car camera and sent it over to his department's investigation division. About a week later, the sergeant called me and wanted to meet up for lunch. The young deputy was also working and I asked him to come along in the event this case came up in conversation. Needless to say, the three of us were dumbfounded by the entire event. The sergeant said their investigations division declined to press charges on the kids based on my deputy's video. The fact that the medical examiner said that the woman had likely died of natural causes at least four hours before we rolled up, and good alibis for where the kids were before they went out jogging. Additionally, the medical examiner stated that the patches of liver mortis indicated that the woman had been sitting at least for a couple of hours in an upright position, just as the college kids described. Either way, we were all freaked out and never figured out exactly how the woman ended up in the car like she did in a span of less than five minutes. Since the ME indicated her death was natural and there were no signs of foul play, we closed the case out and we started calling every 90s Oldsmobile a ghost car for months after the call. This happened to me about five years ago while I had the privilege of working in a men's suit store while studying at a college in Cardiff, Wales. For anyone who is curious, Wales sits just left of England and is directly right of Ireland. Cardiff is a nice city, nowhere as big as England, but it has gone through some pretty rapid modernization as of late. They've done a great job at keeping their historic architecture, but there always seems to be a new Starbucks or Costa Coffee opening up every other week. Some of the buildings in the city center have shiny new facades that wrap around the ancient structures like a shell. This became more evident to me on my first day at the store. My interview for the job took place bright and early one February morning and I remember how cold I was as I made my way past the hustle and bustle of early morning commuters. Having been a student for a year, I wasn't used to being around so many people this early in the morning. That being said, I wasn't really used to being up in the morning, period. When I arrived a good 15 minutes before my interview was due to start, I was greeted by an immaculate looking man in a pinstripe suit who I quickly recognized to be my new potential boss. His name was Andrew. He was a friendly guy in his mid-fifties, silver gray hair, and just looked how you'd expect a manager of a suit store to look. After greeting me, he took me down to the bowels of the building where the staff room was located. We had to make our way down two flights of stairs and through a hallway full of your standard retail fixtures. I remember almost having a heart attack when turning a corner and coming face to face with a naked mannequin just standing there with its hands on its hips defiantly. Oh, sorry about that. I stripped it yesterday as we needed the garment for another display upstairs. Not very modest, is he? Andrew said lightly with a chuckle. I laughed too. I felt comfortable before the interview had begun. This guy had a sense of humor. When we entered the main stock room, I was a little blown away. The walls, ceiling, and flooring were completely different to upstairs. They weren't just bricks, but old carved bricks. The only thing I can compare it to off the top of my head would be something that resembles catacombs. Big archways hug overhead and badly eroded red stone, and the tiles beneath our feet were a dark marble. Andrew, upon seeing my wondering eyes, began to speak again. Ah, yes. I forget that people are usually surprised when they walk in here. I guess I'm used to it. He opened a wooden door that led into a posh-looking staff room complete with carpeted floor, a polished oak table, and a brown leather couch. What I found amazing was I learned the basement down here as well as the basements and all the neighboring buildings all look the same. They were once part of a Victorian tunnel, you see. Uh, they connected every building in the street. Some kind of evacuation tunnel. Andrew finished and indicated for me to take a seat. Two years later, I had finished my course in college and had been asked by Andrew if I wanted a full-time position while I figured out what my next step was going to be. Naturally, I accepted as I really did love the job and the people I worked with had become like family to me. Life being the way it was, I found myself struggling to find jobs that, although I was now qualified for, lacked the experience in a similar field. It was infuriating. How could I experience if nobody will give me a break? Another two years after becoming a full-time member of the staff, 
I was still at the store, but I had managed to progress from part-time sales assistant to assistant manager, which was great for me as it meant a tasty pay raise, and great for Andrew as it meant he could finally take more time off, take vacations, and be with his family. I actually really began to enjoy the extra responsibility. Training new staff, delegating jobs, and helping our team to hit sales targets. It was fun. We are now coming to the reason why I'm writing this. The reason I will never forget that place. It all went down one Sunday morning. Sundays obviously being the quieter days of the trade only required a skeleton crew to run the store. This is usually a manager, me, and one other sales assistant. In this case, a girl named Amy. I quite liked working with Amy. We were of similar ages, she was cute and really down to earth. Most of our quiet periods were spent talking about everything and anything about our lives until we realized how much time had passed and began creating jobs to do out of guilt. One Sunday afternoon, after a pretty uneventful morning, I walked into our office just off the shop floor to email our sales figures to head office while Amy manned the front desk. As we had two sales floors, upstairs was for suits and downstairs was for accessories and shoes, if someone went downstairs, either Amy or myself would have to go with them. One of our rules was that under no circumstances were customers to walk around downstairs unattended. As I began entering figures into a new Excel spreadsheet, I heard Amy's faint voice under the store's collection of non-threatening store music. If my memory serves me correctly, I believe it was Nickelback she was quite rudely interrupting. I reached for the knob of the hi-fi and turned down the volume. Want me to go? Amy called. I poked my head out of the office door. Sorry, what? An elderly lady just went downstairs. Would you like me to go? Or do you want me to watch the shop floor and you go down? I looked back at the barely started spreadsheet and then back to Amy. Oh, it's fine. I'll go. Uh, maybe I can sell her a sports jacket and some cufflinks. I said with a smile. Do it. <laughs> Amy giggled as I walked past her. As I made my way down the steps to the ground floor... I was surprised to find that nobody was there. The room looked pristine and untouched. I took a few steps forward and stretched my neck looking along the rows of formal jackets. Amy? I called upstairs. I heard her shuffle along from the till to the doorway. Hello? She asked. I thought you said there was a lady down here. I asked quickly, glancing back at the room. There is. Watched her go down myself. She said again confidently. I walked the full length of the room, past the shoe displays to the changing rooms and back. Nope. No one here. Are you seeing things? I asked. Amy looked both confused and annoyed. What? Can I come down? She asked. Yes, but quickly. I watched as she made her way around the room and back. What? What the hell? She uttered under her breath while pulling back the curtains of the changing room. See, uh, just like I said, you're seeing things. I swear to God, this is freaky. I literally watched her enter the store at the entrance, the doorbell even chimed. I smiled at her, and she just walked down here. Amy finished. I noticed that color seemed to be fading from her usually rosy cheeks. Just then... I had a sinking feeling. What if she's gone into the basement? I asked, eyebrows raised. Amy put her hand on her mouth in an oh crap sort of fashion. Ugh, what if she's senile or something and just went down there? Did she acknowledge you when you smiled at her? I questioned. Amy's eyes looked upwards and thought before returning to me. She didn't. I thought she was just being rude. Okay. Go back upstairs, I'll go find her, I said a little exasperated. I really wasn't looking forward to this part of the job. One thing I learned from working in the fabulous world of retail is you often meet people from both sides of the mental health spectrum. My second week working at the store, some guy politely used one of our changing rooms to try on a shirt and in doing so took it upon himself to urinate into the small trash can in there. Guess which rookie member of the team had the pleasure of fixing this problem? As I entered the basement level, the first thing to hit me was the void of total darkness. Funny thing about wandering around in the dark, you usually have some sort of natural light so you can at least see your hand in front of your face. But here, 
Deep underground, if the lights are off, you are pretty much completely blind. My hands went to my left and frantically felt for the switch, and with a sigh of relief I flicked it back. The fluorescent tube light bulbs flickered into existence for a few moments before bursting light to all corners of the basement, and as my eyes adjusted, I quickly scanned around. Nobody, I said with relief. The basement stockroom was quiet and untouched and also a complete mess. It was all of our jobs to keep the stockroom tidy, but over the weeks of constant deliveries, it had become more or less a dumping ground with crates stacked on top of each other another reason to not wanting to be wandering around here in the dark. As I began to turn to the door while thinking how it was going to be my sad duty to inform one of my colleagues that she's been hallucinating, I distinctly heard the sound of a refrigerator door closing. I quickly turned to the direction of the staff room. The door was closed but the light from within seeped through the gap under the door. My heart began to race. The old lady was here. She must have somehow navigated her way through the stockroom in the dark and was now making herself at home in our staff room, probably attempting to make herself a nice cup of tea perhaps. Without really thinking, I marched forward and pushed the door open. I was greeted with an empty staff room. The bags and coats hung neatly on peg hooks on the far wall. Cutlery lay strewn around the draining board and a dirty wash rag was lazily dumped on top of them. I remember thinking that perhaps Amy and I had been coming down with something because now I seemed to be hearing things. Just as the worry began to subside, my eyes locked on the small fridge under the counter with its door ajar. Hmm, I thought, and gently nudged it close with the tip of my shoe. It was at this moment my blood ran cold. Hello? Came a shakily elderly voice from behind me. It was one of those experiences where you are so afraid that time seems to slow down. I began turning in the direction of the voice extremely slowly, almost as if on some level I wasn't so eager to lock eyes with whoever was down here. I sighed again, just the empty doorway. I decided I wanted to go back upstairs where the sanity seemed to be, so I closed the staff room door and made my way back across the stock room. Just as my hand gripped the door handle of the fire door, total darkness enveloped me. It was so sudden that I couldn't help but unleash the unmanliest yelp I've ever heard. My hand instinctively fumbled for the light switch and toggled it on and off, to no avail. The lighting was completely gone. Now, retrospectively, a normal person would have opened the door and ran upstairs, saying ta-ta to this effed up situation but something caught my eye in the darkness. A light source. The light was emanating from under the staff room door again. This didn't sit right with me. A lot down here today didn't sit right with me. But in regards to the light, I knew how the electricity worked in the building. All lights on the basement level were connected at the fuse box. If one light goes, they all go. I'm by no means an electrical engineer, but I knew there was no way that light should be on. Now call it basic human curiosity or human stupidity, but I found myself moving towards the light, navigating around the crates until my hands were pressed against the wood paneling of the staff room door. I pushed it, and to my total bewilderment, I was greeted by one horrifying sight. All the cupboards were open now, their doors yanked wide displaying the plates and cups within. Over on the far wall, the coats and bags had come away from the wall hooks and lay crumpled on the carpet below in a pile. A newspaper I had got that morning during my morning commute, which had been neatly folded on the staff room table, was now open and the pages had been pulled out. I remember I almost couldn't breathe. It was a kind of terror I've never experienced before or since, and became instantly aware of how alone I was down here. Hello? I heard the voice again, but this time closer than before. In fact, this time it was right behind me. Now, I'm not sure if this is a coping mechanism of the human brain, but I remember the complete inability to turn around and face the owner of this voice. I was aware of a presence directly behind me and knew only too well that if I had turned in that moment, I'd have seen something that I'd be describing to a therapist to this day. My body went cold 
My hairs in the back of my neck were raised, and I became aware of how annoyingly loud my heartbeat was beating. I looked forward and noticed the bottom half of our small cordless telephone poking out from underneath one of the newspaper pages. The phone lets us make external and internal calls around the building. My hand slowly and shakily reached for it. Still feeling the presence behind me and the unwillingness to turn around, I pressed internal and won and instantly heard the faint sound of a phone ringing above me, followed by footsteps moving from one side of the store to the other. Hello? Amy said amused. A Amy, can you come down here please? I whispered, my voice very slow and steady. What's wrong? She asked. Please, come down here now. I said this time with a hint of panic in my voice. The phone disconnected and I heard the footsteps sprinting across the ceiling above and then silence. Hello? The voice sounded so frail and gravelly now, and I swear I could feel it stepping closer. Somehow being down here and going through this had made me ultra aware in a way that I haven't been since. Just when I thought I was about to crawl under the table with my arms wrapped around my knees, I heard the most amazing sound in the world. Hey, Amy said. I turned around to see a very concerned looking Amy. Hey, I whispered. Are you okay? I nodded slowly. I... I just want to go upstairs, I whispered again. I felt her arm go around mine, and she slowly escorted me out of the basement. A while after, I remember saying to Amy that she was my hero, and that she saved me from quite possibly having a heart attack. She found the story interesting, and would often ask me questions on what I think I would have saw if I had turned to face it but I'm fine not knowing what it looked like. Sometimes I wonder why I had reacted the way I had. Why did I feel such intense fear? And was it my own insecurity and cowardice? Or had I sensed that I was in danger? Or was the voice even real at all? Perhaps I had simply imagined it. I think it's doubtful. I mean, I didn't create the mess in the staff room, and Amy had seen a woman walk downstairs. I don't know, but I do know that I'll always remember this experience. It will be my one unexplainable story. I'm pretty sure everyone has one, and this is mine. Before my wreck on March 29th, I had some paranormal things happening in my new home I had moved into last December. Only about three or four occurrences, but nonetheless freaky. I got an apparition on a camera when snapchatting a buddy. It freaked me out. After I saw it, it seemed like it was trying to make itself known. It would turn on my electric keyboard and start a pre-recorded tune. It would open my fridge, bang on my wall. Then on March 29th, I was in a wreck. I shattered my femur and needed a rod through it. I shattered my left foot by pressing the brake. I cracked my sternum. My passenger and myself survived. The other driver did not, unfortunately. In the hospital for the first week and a half, they kept me drugged up on Dilaudid. Every two hours, they would come in and put a high dose in my IV. I would have family come in, and I would almost never remember them coming except for their shapes that I put together in my mind because I always had my eyes closed. In a trance where I was almost asleep, but I never really felt fully asleep. I would talk to my family and it would make sense to me but when I stopped taking the drugs so often they told me I never made sense. The one person I remember is this man who I never met. I remember him vividly, details about him, and I don't really remember details about anyone else. I never have met this man and he never did speak and when I asked my family or friends about him they say he was never actually there. Fast forward to the day I got out of the hospital. I got home and immediately something happened. It was as if I was being welcomed home. I get through the front door and my mother and father are standing right next to me. I am in my wheelchair. They just got me up the stairs into my trailer that I share with my girlfriend and my two roommates. We were the only ones home and my bedroom door opens by itself. And I have only been home for about two weeks and it's almost every day something happens. Mostly it's knocks that my girlfriend and I all hear. My PS4 turns itself on. 
My TV will turn itself off randomly while being used. My girlfriend never hears any of it, but I have to sleep on my couch because I can't get into my bed without a lot of help. But she said last night the fan in our room started spinning like it was on three and the knob was on zero. The only footage that I have is that of the snap that I sent. Tell me what you think. Many people don't believe the numerous paranormal encounters I have experienced in my childhood home, but they have shaped the person I am today. There is some background information you should know before I delve into my experiences. I live with my mother, grandma and grandpa in a large two-story house in Manassas, Virginia. We were located a stone's throw away from the Bull Run battlefield. Literally I could step off my front porch and in ten strides be in the trails. Now the Battle of First Manassas or the First Battle of Bull Run was basically fought in my backyard in the surrounding woods. The Stonewall Jackson Memorial was about a half mile down the road from our home as well as the old stone school building, dubbed the old stone house if you want to look it up, repurposed as a wartime hospital for injured soldiers. As a kid I would go with my grandpa metal detecting. Over the years in our backyard alone we found numerous spent bullets from muskets, buttons from confederate union uniforms, and loads of native american arrowheads and old pottery. Now onto some of the creepy things my family, myself, and a handful of our guests have witnessed, heard, and felt. As a child I slept in my mother's bed until I was 13, and the only reason I stopped was because we moved away from that house. This is a story that is kind of creepy but honestly it gives me almost a sense of a guardian angel or something of the sorts. I don't have any recollection of this but my mother just loves to retell this incident to me. Apparently I was about 4 years old and didn't sneak into my mother's room the night before. That morning she told me how proud she was I slept in my own bed like a big girl. My response was, The nice man came and tucked me in and told me not to be afraid because he was watching over me. She was a bit freaked out, but it didn't seem sinister unlike some of the other events in our home and didn't push me for much info. I also used to hear my name called around the house and barn. It was almost like someone was calling from far away. I remember asking my grandma if she'd been calling for me, but she had not. She also confided in me that she heard her name called sometimes as well. Over the years, we all heard ourselves being called, but just tried to dismiss it. My mom and I had the downstairs to ourselves, and my grandparents lived upstairs. They would go on trips a lot for stamp shows, leaving my mother and I the run of the house. Almost every time they were gone for a few nights, weird things would start happening. We would hear the TV and radio turn on upstairs, but once we went to check it out, there wouldn't be anything on. We would also hear tons of footsteps going on through the upstairs, as well as the toilets flushing. At night our dog would lay over our legs and continuously growl at the ceiling. It was so creepy seeing as she was a very sweet dog and hardly ever took to growling to anything else. My mom and her three siblings had lived in the house as kids and teenagers and had tons of creepy stuff happen to them. My uncle was sleeping downstairs in bed and woke to a man standing at the end of his bed. He literally had to run past this man, up the stairs and into his parents' bedroom. He told my grandpa what he had seen. Grandpa grabbed an aluminum baseball bat and headed downstairs. Now the previous owners had a schizophrenic son so my grandpa assumed he was having an episode and made his way back to the house in a confused state. Once downstairs they checked all the rooms but to no avail. He then asked my uncle what the man looked like. His description was of a young man in a grey uniform with no hands or feet. His description closely resembled a confederate soldier. This was not the last time he was seen in the house. My grandpa used to be a huge skeptic and only believed in what could be explained by science and fact. While he was reading the paper in bed one night only to look up from the paper and see the aforementioned man by the foot of the bed. He stood there for a moment and then slowly faded away. Well, needless to say this made my grandpa rethink a few things. They also saw him many years later when walking by the open guest room upstairs. The soldier was just sort of hovering over the bed and disappeared. My grandpa is now a strong believer in spirits. 
The story told to me by my aunt brings tears to my eyes every time I retell it or think about it. She was a young teenager and loved to take her horse out for night rides in the national park next to our house. Well, she was in an open field surrounded by trees riding her horse in large circles when he began to freak out. She thought at first that maybe he spotted a bobcat or cougar, but quickly dismissed the theory when an overwhelming sense of dread washed over her. It was then that she spotted it. A hulking black figure, the branches of a tree between her and the trail home. She described it as being like a huge man but completely shrouded in blackness with a glare she could feel piercing through her. His presence was of pure evil. She decided to get out of there and rode as quickly as possible past it. When she arrived in her front yard, it was there waiting for her in the fruit trees of the property. My aunt had her horse race to the barn and she put him out to pasture, bridle and all. She never saw the figure again, but it still shakes her to the bone to even talk about it. Now growing up, my uncle was a bit of a hooligan and frequently snuck people into his bedroom window. One night he heard two men having a conversation out of his bedroom. I should add that his room was on the lower floor of the house and there was gravel outside of the window covering the ground. As he listens to these men, he hears footsteps in the gravel and someone drop keys. He decided to open the window and tell whichever of his friends were out there to get inside and quiet down. Well, when he looked out there, there was no one there. He thought someone was messing with him and told them basically to screw off or show themselves. He heard nothing in response and figured it was one of his friends just messing around. He eventually went back to bed only to hear the conversation start up again. At this point he started to feel freaked out. He got a gun and went outside only to find nothing again. Well I guess he thought it was over and life moved on. Over time though, every year around fall I think this same event would take place. The conversation, the footsteps and gravel and the keys dropping. He apparently just got used to it somehow. Once I was born, my uncle had already moved out, and lo and behold, that became my room. I never heard the keys, but on multiple occasions I did hear footsteps in the gravel, and both my mom and I heard a conversation on the downstairs porch. It was a man and a woman this time. We figured it was my grandparents outside enjoying the nice night. That morning when we asked them about it, they were insistent that at that time, though we heard them, they were sleeping in bed. We were both thoroughly freaked out. These weird events happened to me in early 2014 in Tahunga, a small town on the edge of the Angeles National Forest outside of Los Angeles, California. Actually, this is just the first of a series of events that occurred during my stay in this wonderful but dark little town whose longtime residents called its weird energy the Vale and claims it helps them keep the property developers away. I ride horses and have a dressage horse who needs a lot of attention. At the time I was keeping him at a wonderful little barn in the Angeles National Forest nearest my apartment in town. For context, I'm a 5'9 athletic beef castle of a girl. I ride rank horses, can take a punch, and even though I'm politically very aggressive, I have a sort of red state vibe. I'm originally from Kentucky, love guns, I drive an old Dodge 2500 and generally sauntered through life feeling stupidly afraid of most things and greatly overestimating my own abilities. Like the quintessential American dumbass, I'm one of those people who is sure they would have won fear factor, like no problem. I was often the last person to leave the barn late at night and would turn all of the lights off, making the place pitch black. Darkness has never bothered me and I sometimes hiked alone at night on the fire roads. For several months, this awful bitch of a horse trainer kept this beautiful horse named Irish penned up in a miserable box stall at the back of the property, in constant pain due to a serious problem called laminitis. He broke my heart. I spent about an hour every night with him, holding his massive head and assuring him things would be better soon. He was truly a sublimely wise and kind being. It was as if he wanted to comfort me because I was so sad for him. Man, thinking about him now, my eyes are burning. That situation really hurt me deeply. 
I and many others confronted the old bitch about putting him down, but she refused, and animal control were useless. It was an affront to everything that is good and decent in the universe to keep this horse in pain and isolated, and if I ever get a terminal illness, maybe I'll track her down and gut her. Anyway, one night I came out to care for my own horse, and Irish's stall was empty. He had finally been put to sleep. Thank God, I was so relieved, a weight lifted from my shoulders, and I imagined him in the next world, restored to youth and in tall grass. I worked my horse, groomed, fed, and put him to bed. As usual, I was the last person there. It was about 9.30pm. I walked down the little road that ran between the horse corrals and turned off all the perimeter lights. The farm became impenetrably black, as usual. Only not as usual this time. Every fiber of my being was alive with adrenaline. Something is here with me. Fuck. Frozen. Listening. The horses make their usual sounds, shuffling in their wood chip bedding, obscuring any sounds this thing could be making. I slowly reach inside my sports bra for the thin switchblade I keep under my right boob. Something is here. Something is behind me, in the black area by Iris's old stall. Mountain line, I thought. Unlikely, the horses would be flipping out at the smell. It must be a meth head from the river wash hiding out, planning to rob, rape, or kill me once the lights go down. No, it doesn't feel like that. But it must be that, right? It has to be. So I say, What's up, motherfucker? You wanna bang heads with me, bitch? You wanna get perforated tonight? Let's go. Nothing. I don't think this is human. Panicking inside, I try to move stealthily down the little road, sticking tight to the row of sheds, staying off the road itself. I had a huge new F-150 at that time and as I got closer, I got my keys out, hit the remote that lit up all the lights and I just ran for it, really ran like fuck something is on me and this could be life or death. I get in, lock it and fishtail out of the dirt lot. For some reason I didn't want to drive home. I turned the radio on, drove around the neighborhood, caught my breath and somehow managed to convince myself I'm just a dumb girl who's probably about to go on her period and let her imagination run away with her. I finally park it and go upstairs to my apartment. My roommate was already asleep with her door closed. I brushed my teeth and fell asleep with my sweet old cat. At some point in the middle of the night, my ancient rescue cat wakes up and starts growling this really boss bitch growl like get the fuck out of my room dickhead kind of growl, focus on the door of the bedroom. I go back to sleep. I had a series of terrible dreams that kept waking me up, but the only one I remember was that a little troll-like spirit had moved into the apartment with us. He was about three feet tall, he was invisible but had an outline kind of like the predator so you could perceive his form. He had short little stubby legs, hobbit style big feet, he was portly, he had big, ugly pointy ears that went past the top of his bald head. His arms were skinny and he had claw-like hands. That was a shape and he was a very nasty little spirit. The next morning on the drive into the office I called my roommate. Not wanting to prompt her, I simply asked her, Hey girl, how'd you sleep? And she said, I had the worst dreams, dude. It was like this little midget guy moved into our apartment, sort of like a ghost or something and couldn't get rid of him. It was awful. I nearly rear-ended the car in front of me when she said that. I told her everything that had happened the night before, and she was pretty stunned. I said I'd call my dear friend Will, who has a degree in Ayurvedic medicine, to see what he says. Will explained that in some Eastern traditions, it is believed that any soul who dies in pain is reincarnated as a negative entity who carries the rage and injustice of its situation into the next world. So, if you carry that to its logical conclusion, Irish, the beautiful being who passed away, had been transmuted into this ghastly little fucker and attached himself to me, following me back to my apartment. Ah, crap. And let's just unpack this whole thing for a moment. So a kindly soul is tortured for months until he dies, and instead of receiving merciful healing, he is turned into a shitty demon who tries to be my third roommate? Yeah, great system. Will suggested that my roommate and I do the standard burning of the sage. No idea why that's always the go-to move in hauntings, but we did it. We were both super uneasy in the flat and the cats were edgy. 
He gave us instructions to do a meditation that night before bed. It involves imagining that your body is filled with pure white light. Then you fill the aura around you with this light. Then you fill the aura around you with this light. Then you fill the room with this light. Then to Hunga. Then the state of California. Then Earth. And finally, you will fill the entire known cosmos with this white light and it pushes the negative entity outside of your realm and we wish them a smooth transfer to a safe and healing place where their karma can be cleansed so they can have peace. It sounds like woo-woo shit but honestly it was very comforting and felt great to do it. The next day, all seemed to be well and the cats went back to being barely awake and neither of us had any bad dreams. What bothers me the most about this story isn't the little dude who moved into my house or the fact that it challenged my whole notion of objective reality and the existence of spirits or whatever. It's the idea that there is no justice in the cosmos. It's all just run by a bunch of casually cruel dicks who would do that to a sweet old horse. It's really just unsettling as fuck. I'm an atheist Jew but this made me realize that deep down I believed in or took for granted that there is some sort of fundamental goodness at work in the universe. Apparently not, I thought again. It's all just an ice cold shithole and no matter how good you are in this world, you'll probably get fucked in the next. And so that's just real swell. That's the real horror story of this. And it does haunt me. Everyone you ever loved, your grandparents, your mother, your first pet. Who knows what ghastly abomination they are today. Spirits and the paranormal have followed me my entire life. I'm not sure why, but every house I have ever lived in eventually has some sort of paranormal activity. My mom has theorized that because I am an intuitive, I attract them. But perhaps the most active home I have ever lived in was an apartment that I lived in from the time I was 12 until I was 17, so this will be pretty long. The first instance happened with my old Baby Loves to Talk doll. We had just moved in so my room had boxes of things that I hadn't gone through and gotten rid of so this doll was about 6 or 7 years old. This thing had not worked in years, the batteries having died long ago. One night I was sleeping and all of a sudden I hear this fucking doll say, ABC123 I love you. I have never bolted from my bed so fast. I got my mom freaking out. And as she came to check it out, the thing was still talking and giggling so my mom tries to take the batteries out only to find out it only has one in it to begin with. She took it to the dumpster that night. The next big thing to happen to me was one night when I was playing my PlayStation, PS1. All of a sudden the TV shut off, for no good reason. It was one of the old tube TVs so I leaned forward to turn the TV back on. The picture came back but as soon as I let go of the button, it would shut off again. I held it down for a few seconds hoping it would fix it and my PlayStation randomly started restarting over and over. I let go of the button and the TV stayed on, but the screen kept glitching so I tried to turn it off. This time the TV would only stay off if I was holding the button down. Finally I decided to unplug it and plug it back in and when I turned it back on it was on the introduction screen for the TV. Now this TV was top of the line when we got it. So when you first set it up, it has this 5 minute video that plays to show you how to use it. It is only supposed to play once during the initial setup. There wasn't even an option to watch it again. As soon as the video ended, it turned off again, and once again, I had to hold the button down to keep the screen on. At this point, I went to tell my mom that the TV was broken. As I'm telling her, there's this really loud static sound coming from the living room. We both go to look and the TV is on one of those empty channels with just static and the volume is turning up as we're watching the screen. My mom unplugs the TV, tells me she'll deal with it in the morning. So, I'm sleeping. I hear really loud music in my room and I assume it's the TV, so I go out to ask my mom to keep it down. As soon as she sees me, she looks a little freaked out and says the TV is working again. I was really tired, so I just said, good. We don't have to get a new one. Can you turn it down though? I'm trying to sleep. That's when I noticed that the TV was on and turning up again while I was watching it. It was unplugged. The last story I'll tell you about was one night when I was 15. I was really into working out so I was doing so in my room late at night. As I'm doing my crunches I said in my head, 
As soon as I'm done, I'm going to get a granola bar. So I finish my set, got up to go to the kitchen, and when I get to the dining room, I see that the entire box of granola bars is strewn all over the floor, and the pantry is wide open. I just slowly stepped back into my room and hid under the covers until I fell asleep. About five years ago, I was taking a political geography course in college. The professor was a friendly guy about 50 years old and had a stereotypical straight-talking no-bullshit attitude. He was from Texas. One evening, I was in his office for some extra help and the conversation led to a story he remembered when he was a kid, about eight years old. He remembered being in the back seat of his car while his parents were in the front, and it was nighttime on a long Texas road with nobody else around. All of a sudden, he remembered the car being completely bright with a rainbow kaleidoscope of color, and he remembered the source of the lights being an object flying directly above them. He said his parents were completely freaked out and screaming, and it was complete chaos. After about a half a minute, it suddenly stopped. He said that he tried talking to his parents about it when he was an adult, wondering if he had remembered it wrong as a kid, but they acknowledged that it happened and didn't want to talk about it. Even he seemed uncharacteristically uncomfortable while telling the story. I work in a mental health facility. The facility itself was founded 75 years ago. Currently, it is a residential treatment center for children. Originally, it was a psychological ward. Most of my experiences are in one of the longest standing buildings. The same building has a type of entryway, though it's just got a bookshelf and a front door only used for aesthetic purposes. One of the walls in this entry was a punching bag of sorts for a particular patient. When she'd get mad, she would just go in there and take her anger out on the wall. One day she broke through the wall. Behind the wall, a room. One desk, one chair, and an axe. The room had been completely closed off. A mystery. Currently the building is being redone. They've added large windows and extended some of the old unused spaces in order to make office space. One evening I was walking to my car alongside these windows. As I passed by, a shadowy female figure with crazy frizzy hair leapt at me as if pounding on the window from the inside. That one gave me a jolt. These rooms are not in use at this time, just empty and waiting for office furniture. I took the same route to my car every evening and it always gives me the hair standing up goosebump feeling. I tend to avert my eyes from the windows not because I'm scared, but because I know the probability of my seeing something is pretty high and I'd just rather not. Now, a story that isn't mine regarding the building. It's evening, patient sleeping, pounding on that door I previously mentioned that's rarely used. Staff jump, get up, check the door, no one's there. They figure that maybe the facility officers are playing a prank, so they call. Nope. After their shift ends, they all go to the observation room to check cameras. The tape rolls, they find the moment. They see themselves jump up and scurry around, and no one is there. I've seen many shadowy figures, heard knocking, scratching, and even crying, and I will never ever be suckered into working overnight at this place. Rusk, Texas, 1984 Rusk, Texas was a little sketchy back in the day according to my mom. The town has a mental institution near it, which added to the town's quirky reputation. My mom worked at a car dealership that doubled as a repair shop that her dad, my grandfather, co-owned. My mom was 22 at the time and she was a single mother, raising my older half-sister, three years old at the time. It was a tough time for her, just coming off a divorce with her first husband who was pretty much an asshole. One day, an elderly black man came into the shop to have a look at his car. He was very, very friendly to my mom. He would come in a few times that year due to problems with his engine. I believe his car was around two decades old at that time. Eventually, he and my mom became sort of like friends, always talking about each other's families. He'd bring cakes and cornbread with him every time. Sometimes he would drop by just to say hello. As their friendship grew, their conversations became personal, and he knew about my mom's struggles and depression. He always listened to her calmly and patiently. 
My mom says he seemed to know the right thing to say every time. Very uplifting guy, apparently. He lit the room up when he entered. Well, one day my mom offered to take him home on the outskirts of town. This guy lived outside the city limits of Rusk. When my mom pulled up to his house, it looked dilapidated. Like seriously, it was in very poor condition. Mold grew on the right side of the house. The dark green paint was chipping. The front yard was full of weeds with lots of overgrown shrubbery, etc. This wasn't a neighborhood either. There were several acres separating his home from the ones down the road. That's how it was in that entire area. This part of Rusk was sprinkled with small wooded areas and open plains. Beautiful, but not the kind of area you want to get lost in at night, given the coyotes. Not to mention some illicit gang activity and drug dealing. She felt sorry for him and watched him enter the house, turn back, and wave goodbye with a smile on his face before closing the door. That was the last she ever saw of him. About a month later or so, she wondered why he had stopped coming by to the shop to say hello, so she drove out to his house to see if he was okay. The dude lived alone, so maybe something had happened to him, she thought. She came to the house, knocked, and no one answered. My mom left and sort of brushed it off. Time goes by again and she still doesn't hear from him. She decided to drive out there again. No answer at the door. She drove down the road, which was very gritty, dusty, and with a roading pavement to the neighbor's house. The neighbor answered and was completely puzzled when my mom asked about the old black guy down the road. He told her nobody has lived in that house since the 60s. He legitimately had no clue what she was talking about. Afterwards, she talked to a few people in the area, downtown by the auto shop, and most of them said pretty much the same thing, that hardly anybody lived on that side of town, and that none of them had ever even heard of the elderly black man in that area. She was pretty upset that he disappeared off the radar. Eventually, my mom got her shit together, got a better job, and moved out to Nacogdoches in 86, where she eventually met my dad in 88. To this day, my mom believes that that guy was an angel. At our department, we had fairly strict policies regarding how we handled 911 calls that were either misdials or dead air, static. We always sent two officers out to the address to ascertain why and how the call was made. Our state had a database of this information and put out statistics every year on this info. Additionally, it was a fairly useful deterrent against the kids who loved prank calling and the old folks who called dispatch just to have someone to talk to. Like I stated before, we were a fairly small county. This particular case involves some fairly strange 911 calls in a newer subdivision in our county. Shortly after I began working as a deputy in early 2001, Real estate developers began to build expensive housing in a newly cut subdivision that ran against one of the larger creeks in our county. Seemingly overnight, a huge wooded area turned into $800,000 plus of housing. At night, myself and another deputy would go on foot patrol through the new subdivision. It was a way to kill time on slow nights and another way to fulfill our curiosity about how big these houses really were. However, there was one larger Victorian-style two-story house that overlooked the river that we typically did a quick patrol through and got the hell out of there. I could never put my finger on it, but I always had a feeling of uneasiness when we walked on the property and through the home as it was under construction. The other deputy, a good friend of mine, always told me that shadows were watching him when we walked through that house. We jokingly called the house Marilyn Manson's Crib. We never felt weird in any other situation or location in that subdivision. Months passed and most of the subdivision was complete by early summer. People began to move in and all shifts at the sheriff's department began to patrol the area. However, the house I felt strange in had seemingly came to a construction standstill. From talking to the general contractor, the real estate company had three potential buyers for the home, but they all backed out for various reasons. Now, this was not uncommon due to the high prices and uncertainty over property taxes, but something in my mind just didn't add up. After speaking to some of the subcontractors involved, it seemed like the potential buyers toured the property and noped out of the deal as quick as possible. Around December 2001, a buyer was finally found for the house, but the closing had to be delayed to finalize some utility issues in the area. 
About two weeks before the new owners closed on the home, our dispatch received a 911 call from the home with dead air. I was on shift that night and took lead while another deputy headed my way. I went over to our secondary radio channel and began asking a ton of questions to our dispatcher about the nature of the call. All she could advise was she was getting dead air. The callback number was showing all sixes, 666-666-6666. Incredibly cliche, I know, but the address was showing to be the creepy house in the new subdivision. I found this quite odd as the general contractor sent our department the housing number for this particular street a couple of days before the call. I figured our dispatch supervisor had updated our 911 system to reflect these new addresses. When I rolled up to the house, the house was completely dark. I stayed in my patrol vehicle and hit the house with my spotlight while I waited for backup to arrive. Nothing was found out of the ordinary and no signs of vandalism were discovered. However, The entire time I was there, I felt a heaviness that I could only describe as someone pushing down on my shoulders and weighing me down. We closed the call out as unfounded. After we cleared, I let our patrol sergeant know what was going on. He felt that it was an error with the 911 system and stated we needed to inform the day shift dispatch supervisor. The next morning, I notified our dispatch supervisor about the error and was met with a perplexed look. She proceeded to tell me that this was impossible because the utility company had not run phone service to any of the houses in that part of the subdivision yet. Apparently, this was the utility issue that was preventing closing for the homeowners. She stated that she was waiting until the end of the week to update the 911 system to reflect the new addresses, as it would be a waste of time to load in new addresses with no telephone service. Thus, the address could not have appeared on our computer-aided dispatch or the CAD system. I believed our dispatch supervisor on her assessment. She had been with the county for 10 plus years, seen the 911 system designed and implemented, and generally did a very good job. So, I took her on her word, which unsettled me even more. Determined to get to the bottom of the issue, I passed this issue onto the day sergeant and asked if one of the deputies could follow up with the phone company if they were out working near that house. Later that evening, I found a note in my patrol box that stated, Phone company is working on the lines across the street. Won't be working on that address until later this week. Phone company doesn't know what's causing a 911 issue. Maybe dispatch got the address wrong. That night, dispatch received another 911 call with dead air from the same house seemingly impossible address included. Once again, we responded and nothing was found out of the ordinary. The deputy that responded with me that night told me afterward that he felt like he was being watched the entire time we checked the perimeter of the home. I still felt the heaviness when walking around the house as well. The next morning, the patrol sergeant and I both spoke with the dispatch supervisor and basically told her the impossible was occurring and we needed to get to the bottom of it. She pulled the records from the night before, and sure enough, the impossible address was being sent from some unknown phone lines to our 911 system, which propagated out to the dispatch operator's CAD and our in-car computers. By that evening, we all received an email from the dispatch supervisor stating that she had no idea how this was happening and believed it to be a glitch that she corrected in the 911 system. However, She added the new addresses anyway since the phone company was almost done working in the area. Basically, she had no damn clue what was causing this problem. We started getting nightly 911 calls to this house. Our patrol sergeant finally told dispatch we wouldn't be responding until the buyers moved in. In some weird way, this made me feel much better. I absolutely hated responding to that house. The next week, On one of my nights off, I heard on my radio that the patrol sergeant on the differential shift told two deputies to get to the bottom of what was going on at that house. Apparently, he believed that kids were somehow tampering with the phone system and just trying to waste the county's time. Bored and somewhat curious, I called the patrol sergeant on his cell phone and asked if the 911 call came in with dead air, like it had for us multiple times previously. He said this particular call was downright creepy. He stated dispatch answered the call, and it sounded like someone was either gagged or the phone was completely muffled. Apparently, the person on the other end of the line sounded like they were in distress, 
and sounded like they were talking at a rapid pace. Now, at this point, the new owner still had not moved into the house and, as far as I know, had not connected the phone service. Like all the other times before, the deputies got on scene, checked the perimeter, and looked through the house to the best of their abilities and found nothing. However, one of them mentioned feeling unusually cold when walking near the back of the property. I talked with him later as this was fairly strange since he was the only one who felt it, and our average temperature at night in December hovers a little above 55. The deputy who reported the coldness was directed by the sergeant to park in front of the house for a couple of hours to look out for anything suspicious. Apparently, the deputy lasted about another hour and a half before throwing up about six or seven times on the side of the road and took off for the evening. I talked with him about his experience a couple of days later and he stated he felt fine after he left the area. However, he said the longer he was near the house, the sicker he felt. Anecdotal at best, but it still creeped me out. A few weeks passed, the new homeowners, husband, wife, and two kids moved in, stayed less than three months, and put the home on the market at a fairly substantial loss. We received numerous 911 calls from the homeowners, ranging from prowlers in the area to break-ins with a suspect still in the residence. Now, the calls were coming from the alarm company instead of the homeowners themselves. Apparently, they installed a fairly high-end security system with motion sensors that called the security company after the owners armed the system in the master bedroom before going to sleep. Eight out of ten calls we received were for motion sensor activation alarms. I probably responded a total of 20 times in three months to the house. I think the alarm company was out there almost as many times, but could never find a defect in the system. The owner, husband, was continually traveling for business, leaving the wife and kids home for the better part of the three months they lived there. The wife was absolutely convinced the house was haunted. Now, based on the contact I had with the wife, I tended to believe her. She was well educated, very articulate, and her description of shadows moving scared the hell out of me, as that was eerily similar to what my friend encountered. In fact, my deputy friend who often responded to the calls with me made it known to the wife that he saw something similar before the house's construction was complete. I still jokingly blame him for costing that family a ton of money after they got the hell out of there. Before the family moved, we encouraged them to get with their alarm company and install cameras that activated with the alarm system to see if they could get to the bottom as to what was causing the motion sensors to activate and call the alarm company. However, they never did. I think the wife's persistence got to the husband and he sold the house just to get her to stop talking about it. During the last month they were there, our sheriff felt it necessary to send an off-duty deputy to sit outside the residence on more than three occasions just to ease the mind of the wife. Each time, a different deputy was sent. All of them reported feeling strange while on assignment, but no one reported seeing anything suspicious. Since the first family left, that house was owned by at least 12 different families since 2002. We kept getting 911 calls that were either from the alarm company and or dead air for as long as I worked at that department. Most owners didn't stay for more than a year and a half. I think most of them stayed there just long enough to sell the house at a reasonable price to the next poor unsuspecting buyer. I particularly felt bad for a family who got stuck with the house during the housing crisis of 08 and 09. I can't stress how strange this is as a majority of the original owners in the subdivision continued to live there, and we rarely got calls to any other house in the subdivision. I could probably write a book about that house based on the nine years I worked at that department.